Hello traders, I'm Alberto, a relationship manager at Pepperstone. I've been having more and more conversations about the US election on the 5th of November and with the markets now on the move, I thought this was an opportune time to look at the recent news flow, the respective policies and the connection to the financial markets. With me today there is Chris Weston, head of research. Hi Chris, Hi. Good thank night. you for being here. Pleasure. Chris, it's been a very lively three or four weeks in the US political uh, news flow and we've still got 100 days. Uh, uh, to go until the day of the election. Do you want to set the scene and review how the race is shaping up? Yeah, thanks for having me on and uh, welcome everyone. Um, I think it's obviously been a, a crazy, uh, turbulent few, three or four weeks uh, in, in, the, in the election news flow. I guess obviously we had uh, the disastrous first election uh, or the first debate on, on Biden's behalf there. We obviously had the, saw the attempted assassination situation. Uh, we've seen what Donald Trump pick J.D. Vance as his, his VP and his running mate, although there's some conjecture as to whether he's actually going to last in that position for some period of time. Obviously, we saw Biden stepping down. You know, Harris has come in as the nominee or the favourite there, and yeah, she's given a 98% probability that she's going to run into run into that position, and that, that position will be galvanised going through into the Democratic National Convention on the 19th and the 22nd. And actually, Harris, to be fair, now is, 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 is raking in some very, very good... Um, you know, capital from the donors. I think in the last week she's she's pulled in two hundred million dollars, which is huge. And her approval rating, uh, her likability rating, um, even from independents, is is is, is you know, far higher than where we're seeing for for Trump at the moment. Now, in terms of the race, um, yeah, with 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 Harris coming in, um, yeah, the polls have closed down and, and tightened quite sharply, to be honest. Um, you know, if you have a look at the real clear politics. Um, average polling at the moment, it's come right. And Trump still has a, a small a small lead, but it's come really, really tight uh, in that situation. And I think it will probably remain so for some time. Now, I think we're also having a look at um, Betfair uh, as one mechanism. Um, you know, Biden is, uh, sorry, Trump is ahead with 58%. That's what it's going to, uh, uh, that's the payment at the moment. Also, uh, Harris is, is somewhere behind uh, with a 39% probability. Where it's interesting though is if you have a look at the um, the predict it another prediction site that's very close to 50 50 now in terms of Trump versus Harris so uh, the polls have closed closed pretty sharply on the back of that and and you know it's it's what was a week or two weeks two weeks ago was firmly a, a Trump uh, presidency in the in the market size or po polling size um, and then a red wave has now become a much tighter debate. Let's focus on Trump and the Republican agenda. What are the most important policies for markets and how do you best express them? Well, if we'd spoken about this two weeks ago, I would have said this was really the only question in town. Yeah. Um, and the biggest factor really is, is whether or not there was going to be a red wave. So whether we got Trump in the White House, um, but we also got the, the Republicans taking the House and the Senate and both Congress, because that would have been very, very important on the fiscal side of situations. For them to push through fiscal policy and some of the more sort of contentious points, they would have needed that smooth passage to be able to pass that. That's now up for debate because polls have come in so tightly. And I think, yes, the House battle, which I think is really going to be very important. So, you know, Two weeks ago, we were probably leaning towards the Republicans getting the House, um, but that may be a more of a tall order. They'll get the Senate. The Republicans will get the Senate, um, and you know we'll see what happens with, with Trump versus Harris. But you know, it's, I think it's the House which is really, really important because that could see you having a split Congress, which means things like fiscal will struggle to get through. But I think yeah, like for for markets, I guess the the most important parts are around regulation or deregulation, um, and that really focuses on on small caps. We've been looking very closely. Um, at you know, the Russell and the massive outperformance we've recently seen of the Russell relative to the S&P 100 or the, or the NASDAQ, for example. It's been a massive outperformance there. So regulation, I think, is a very big positive. Um, and Trump's promise to, to push through you know, deregulating America. Uh, the second stage is, is fiscal, as we talked about. And the big policy there, if they can, if we were to see a red wave, um, would be the idea that they're going to roll over the 2017 uh, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, which, you know, in theory, we've, we've been hearing statistics that over the next over the coming 10 years that that could blow out the deficit by another four and a half trillion dollars um i think you've got to look at immigration um and there's obviously some 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 big policies around that and that whilst that obviously leads into a social issue um it also has a big Im impact potentially on inflation as well if you remove 15 million people um you know in, in undocumented um Aliens, if you want to call it that, um, yeah, there is an impact on 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 what's happened with it, inflation as well. And then, of course, the big one then is is also trade 
and, and trade tariffs as well, where, where Trump at the moment is saying that he wants to put 60% trade tariffs on incoming Chinese goods and 10% on a more broader basis across all goods. Um, I don't think they're going to go for it anywhere near in that capacity. Trump is coming out when playing his bargaining card, as he does as a real estate mogul. But um, obviously, that would have significant implications for, for the Chinese economy, for the European economy, for Mexican economy, for the global economy, for the US situation also would be would be probably dollar positive by about 5% on a trade weighted basis. So really, they're the factors I'm looking at. Um, I think, you know, well, the protectionist side, we've, we've seen a reaction in China, you know, both Biden, when he was uh, when he was running as nominee, was was looking at the companies that were feeding the technology into the chips for Taiwan, who produced ninety percent of the semiconductor chips. Um, Bitcoin's another situation um, where yeah, we've just seen the, the Bitcoin conference over the weekend, where Donald Trump saying he wants to champion Bitcoin, he wants to make the US the yeah the home of crypto, um, you know, mining effectively, um, and he wants to fire Gary Ginsler, who's the SEC. Um, Head of the SEC there and trying to push through more, you know, pro crypto regulation. So, you know, if we were to see a red wave or even, you know, Trump in the, you're going to see a, potentially see a higher correlation between Bitcoin and Trump's um, Trump's rating there as well. So, really, they're the factors I'm looking at. Okay, so you've, we just talked about Trump's policy on trade, immigration, fiscal, and desire for a weaker uh, U.S. dollar. With the U.S. inflation still uh, running above three percent, uh, and many of the goods services that U.S. households pay uh, around 30-50% higher than the level seen pre-COVID. Um, are you, what are your thoughts uh, about these policies? Like, they seem like to uh, stake inflation implemented? Um, I think there's a lot of stuff, that, there's a lot of the factors which are contradictory. Um, you know, I, I didn't touch on this one in the last one, you mentioned the dollar, but um, yeah, the, the Trump camp have been arguing the, the, the strong dollar and the US dollar on a trade weighted basis is up at 15% from, from 2020. Um, but that's obviously, the, he, the, there is a view that the, the com co countries with, with large trade surpluses to the US, such as China and, and Taiwan and countries like that, are, um, are you know, disadvantaged American uh, in, in various capacities. So they want a, a significantly weaker dollar. Um, I think that's a really in interesting situation because how do they get to that point? Well, I don't think J.D. Vance has much of a say in that situation. I think he'll be like Mike Pence where he, you know, is if he st if he stays the course, um, you know, I don't think he's, Trump's going to give him much limelight. It's really going to be down to who is going to be U.S. Treasury Secretary that, that will decide that situation. And, you know, if they were to go down something like a Plaza Accord, uh, which is what Robert Lighthizer wants to see, if he was to get the gig, I don't think he will, um, then that could have massive implications on, on U.S. growth, inflation, you know, bring down the dollar and, you know, you bring in tradable inflation. Um, I think if you were going to go and put 60% tariffs on China, I mean, that would have a significantly negative impact on the Chinese economy. So if we get look anywhere like we're going to get anywhere near that point, I think, you know, I would be looking at trades around short um, companies which have high revenue generation in China. I mean, you can take something like NVIDIA, which generates 17 percent of its of its of its sales in China. Um, Tesla, 22 percent of its sales. But I think those companies will be shunned. Uh, and I'd probably look to offset that by being long companies which are a lot more inward facing with its sales which is where the russell company you know the small cap companies do well um, but obviously if you're going to put 60 10 tariffs on a broad basis that's going to raise the price level by by two three percentage points that will be inflationary um you know if you if you reduce immigration where a lot of that immigration has boosted labor uh, you know the, the labor market but it's been very low paid jobs you take that out in theory that could be um inflationary um he is offsetting that by saying that they want to produce 3 million barrels a day of oil more, which will lower the oil price, which will be deflationary. So that's somewhat offsetting. But I think the idea that the idea that you go out and, and roll over the tax cuts um, in 2025, that's going to boost spending, um, consumption, get animal spirits ramping up again. That's obviously inflationary. You mix that with a weaker potential, weaker dollar. You mix that in with trade tariffs. And you get higher inflation, which is why everyone wants to go out and do these so-called steepeners where, you know, you sell the long end of the treasury curve and yields go up faster than the short end. Um, it doesn't feel like it's like the American public wants to see higher inflation. So I think that would be a I don't know how they would deal with that situation. I suspect what would happen if we were to see inflation expectations move up as a result of this, 
is that they would lean on the Fed very, very heavily and say, you know, you've got you've got now a third mandate to keep long-end borrowing costs really low. Otherwise, the US Treasury Department are going to have to have a much greater interest component on, on resurfacing its debts. And, yeah, we're going to need to see, um, you know, policy fairly fairly loose in that in that capacity there so it doesn't it doesn't make a lot of sense which makes to me that whilst i think the market gets a highest uh, yeah the market will like a trump presidency for deregulation purposes the idea that they're going to come out and you know do 60 percent tariffs in china and 10 percent, i think that's just a lot of conjecture and a lot of bravado um, coming out of the highest level and then they'll work it whack. Just like we saw with Mexico as well, you know, back in 2016 where, you know, he, every day you'd wake up, the Mexican peso was down 2% because he was like, oh, NAFTA's a bad deal and we're going we're gonna to scrap it. Um, and then ultimately what happened was was vastly different. They just reworked NAFTA. Um, and I think that's exactly what you'll see. You'll see all these massive le levels and it'd be walked back. There's no way it's going to go through at 60%, but it's... Okay. Summarizing what you just said, what are the most market-friendly outcome from the election, you think? Um, look, I mean, it's, it's difficult to say, but I think, you know, once we saw the first debate and Trump's um, polling, or, you know, the, it, uh, it, it rise, arose in, in the prediction markets, and then after his assassination attempt, um, yeah, when, he, when his probability of winning the election got to close to 70% or, or even higher, um, what we saw was an initial rally in, in NASDAQ and equity futures. That tells me that the market is, is, is looking more positively at a, a Trump win. I think he would want to see the equity market higher. I think he would do everything in his power to try and you know, show that the equity market is a reflection on him. Um, and I think you know, whilst we look at trade and, and trade tariffs as, a, as, a, as, a, as an equity negative, certainly those companies which are very exposed to China, um, I think um, the idea of deregulating American industries would be a very big positive. He's promising that. Whether we get it is another thing. Um, but I think that would be a huge equity kicker. But again, it really depends on the House and if, if they can get that through. And obviously, if they can roll over the tax cuts and keep long-end borrowing low, uh, costs low, that would be a big positive for equity markets. I think the market's shown, it's not a political view of mine, mm -hmm. the market has shown that um, that they've rallied when Trump's um, uh, 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 prediction uh, chance of winning has increased and i think that that's telling me what i need to know there okay awesome thank you for that let's talk about trading the election okay looking ahead what are the key dates in the u.s election cycle worth considering what is the possible impact on volatility yeah it's a good one it's a good question i mean i think um we're now keeping our eyes on, on polls now that it looks like you know, Kamala Harris is, is the nominee. And what we're going to see now is the, the, the full Democratic Party unite around her going into that. It's not about her. It's about uniting the party. And that they've got, some, for the first time in a long time, they've actually got some positive PR. Yeah, you know, they're, 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 you know, Kamala Harris is raising a significant amount of money, way more than the Republicans are getting. Um, you know, her approval rating is, is significantly hotter, even in the swing states. You know, Wisconsin, Michigan, um, Nevada, all these places, you know, her, her approval ratings is, is looking pretty good. Um, and it's going to be a closer, a close election. So I think we're going to keep our eyes on the polls. Um, I think they'll make more sense as in, in, the, in the weeks ahead. I wouldn't trust them now. Um, but the national convention, the Democratic National Convention, is probably the next big date um, on August the 19th to 22nd. And there's obviously going to be a, a show of solidarity and unity between the party. From that point, then, it's going to be the, the next debate, the live debate, which I think everyone's going to be watching very closely. Um, and that's going to be on the 10th of September. Um, and it, I, I, you know, I think Harris is, is very, very bad at reading off auto, auto cues, which is why a lot of there's a lot of negative about her live speeches. But I think when she debates, I think she's going to be I think she'll be a very sharp and energetic um, person. I think she'll she'll go very strongly against uh, Trump. Um, so that'd be a really interesting one. And then from that point, you know, obviously, we sort of go down into into any kind of um, PR releases and 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 you know, speeches that happens and how presidential she sounds, um, and that's what we're going to keep. And we're going to price risk off the polls and the the prediction markets more than anything else. So I think that's really what we're watching. But as we come closer to the election, I wouldn't be surprised if we were to see, you know, range expansion pick up, um, you know, liquidity come out, which is going to cause those more exasperated moves playing through, and it will get wild. And I think we can start thinking about tr trading the effect side of things if we if we do feel that. Trump's going to get um, uh, a red wave or, you know, he's going to poll very well. Um, 
people want to run long US dollar positions in there, specifically against euros, against the, the Chinese yuan, and also Mexican peso. But it's too early to do that now. I mean, we're still talking about Fed cuts and yeah, growth dynamics. But to trade the election in the FX market, I think you probably want to be waiting really until late September and early October to be putting it. Obviously, it's a spot market. So um, people want to run long US dollars if we were going to see a Trump win. Um, and we are going to see tariffs, but it's too early to trade that right now. Okay. For clients relying upon technicals, price action, or uh, running algorithmic uh, strategies, why is the election important for them? Um, well, we won't be looking at polls and, and news and, and, you know, you just don't really care about that sort of stuff. The market tells you what it wants to do. It aggregates everything into, into the price action. It's the, the aggregation of all human behaviours and beliefs, and, and it tells you what trades... Yeah, you'd be running and how the market's thinking. That's what I'm looking at. But for 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 these, for you know, systematic traders, algorithmic traders, um, technical traders, what's most important is is the market environment. You know, the the range, the typical range, um, the volatility, the the ability to for trending conditions, for mean reverting, distributing days, um, and and I think as we go through there, you're going to see wider ranges and you're going to see much more volatility coming through where markets will move on apparently no news whatsoever, and that's what you see going into the election. Um, so yeah, your market environment as is, is, is really what you trade. Um, and it doesn't matter what you, what, who you are or what you trade. Um, that's the most important thing. And I think that will radically shift as we go into the election. So that would mean potentially taking on more risk in a position, um, taking your position size down if the, if the volatility adjusts. So that's, that's what I'll be looking at. All righty. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, there was, you know, for your time, the opportunity to learn more about this. Uh, if anyone wants to get in touch with me or with Chris, please reach out to Pepperson. Thank you. Thank you.